you know when you've spent way too much time over the past few days in Mind Valley <laughs> and always makes me feel like my head's about to explode. But I thought I would share the love and try and organize some thoughts uh, that I've been having over the past couple of days and, and a couple of really interesting client conversations because I think um, I think it's super relevant in terms of understanding the the push pull effect and um, and the the shift between linear mindsets and exponential thinking. So I'll do my best to try and organise my thoughts. Uh, so I've been watching a bit of uh, Michael Beckwith's work, and um, and in particular he was talking about four levels of consciousness. Now I'm not a huge fan of levels. One of my other great mentors who I love dearly has um, this brilliant quote around levels are simply traps that we set for one another in um, advancing our growth. So I'm not a huge fan of levels, but I think the construct works here in terms of trying to understand some of the dynamics of what's going on and meeting people where they're at. So, um, so level one, uh, what they call, call that victim mentality, that idea that stuff is being dumped on me, I have to react to it, that idea that I don't necessarily have control over my environment, my surroundings, the world is throwing a bunch of stuff at me and I just have to respond. Uh, level two, uh, an understanding that uh, actually I can create my own reality to some degree, I can manifest things, I can take action, I can get results, um, and, I, and I work through creating the world that I want. Level three, uh, more around surrendering into the flow of things that are happening around you, learning to work with that flow for um, greater, deeper outcomes. Level four, kind of peeling back the veil um, that the uh, the barrier between self and universe starts to dissolve, right? So four layers of consciousness. And uh, in particular, I, with this one client that I was working with this week, and we've had some great coaching conversations, and, um, and he's really inspired me to, to try and verbalize some of what's been going on. And uh, so he and his team have a, a great vision for um, their company and where they're trying to go and it was a lot around uh, the conversation this week was a lot around him being able to show up as uh, the best that he can be to help this team to keep moving forward right so the team's come an amazing way and a long way in the past sort of four to six months new to agile ways of working um, you know trying to go after an outcome that seems almost impossible in the time frame and the scope of what's being asked of them uh, they've really, really come a, a long, long way, and it's been great to watch. They've really adapted to uh, these principles around new ways of working. But what happened uh, in the past couple of weeks was that this client had noticed that uh, people were fixated on a particular date. There's a there's a seasonal aspect to this, and people were fixating on, we need to get this thing done by a date. Uh, classic project, right? And and what what he'd been able to do was to recognize that that date and that pressure was causing a hurdle for the team. Uh, you know, you could see the stress and anxiety. Uh, people were starting to shut down. They weren't functioning towards the outcome any longer. That you know, this, it was getting to the point where the date was creating so much anxiety that it actually just wasn't helping. It's not about driving the project at this point. It's not not about any of this. It's just not working. Um, and he had the presence and and foresight to work with his peers and his boss to actually. Um, the, the this small core team of sort of three or four had got to the point where they realized that they actually needed to let go of the attachment to the date and that they needed to surrender into that and have this beautiful kind of couple of day period where as they let go of that date they realized that uh, they were still actually going to get to the outcome that they had expected um, or that they've been looking for by the state, it just wasn't going to look like the way that they expected it to be. It wasn't going to be a fully functioning system with a bright, shiny bow around it, right? It was, they were going to have all of these pieces, and they were actually going to have a functional sort of C community of, of, of system in terms of tech and process, uh, but it wasn't anything like what they had envisaged in their head. And so there was this beautiful window where for a couple of days, a couple of the core leaders in that team actually realized that that letting go was first off going to be more beneficial to the working team in terms of their own stress levels and 
their ability to just kind of unblock that stress around the date so that people could actually move again and they could actually do work because actually stressing about the date was what was causing people to not take action. So the presence and the foresight and the courage to actually let go of that. Uh, and also this beautiful shift in terms of uh, actually we are getting what it was that we were wanting. It just doesn't show up in the way that we expected. And so how do we work with that? So that's, that's sort of part one of the story. And, at the, and, and in all of that, uh, the next thing that happened was that in letting go of the attachment to the date, the working team had gone, cool. We don't need to worry about that for another six months and basically picked up tools and walked off. And so all of a sudden, nothing was happening. So whereas before there was a lot of this nothing happening through fear and anxiety and busy work and, and stressing, now people just seem to have blanket walked away from things and gone, well, that's six months away. We don't need to worry about that. And so the, the real question that, um, that this client had got to was, how do I create that sense of urgency and pace and, and bring back that level of engagement? Because that's, that's the bit that was missing when we had forced a date on people. But that's also equally the bit that's missing now that we have released the pressure valve. And conscious enough to know that simply setting a date six months from now is the same pattern of behavior it's reinforcing all of the old system and the old ways of working. And it's not actually going to get us the outcome that we need. All we're going to do is get five months in and then start stressing about the new date, right? So, so consciously aware of this pattern that was being set up. And, and, and the big the question, well, how do we start to create that sense of urgency and that engagement and that curiosity and that creativity that we had only a couple of months ago when the date was still far enough away that it wasn't stressing people out? So great question, right? If we are choosing not to use a line in the sand date, a manufactured urgency to create that sense of purpose in the team, what is the tool that we need to pick up um, to, to, to create that sense of urgency? Do we pick up a tool from the traditional ways of working that says actually we just put another date in the calendar and we manage people to that? Well, actually, no, that doesn't feel right. Or do we pick up another tool that is of... Uh, a, a, a new way of working, a, a more elevated, I would say, level of awareness. And, and, and if so, what is that tool? What does it look like, right? And so, so in, that, in that sort of part one, we've, we've got a clear question around, well, how do we generate that sense of urgency? But equally, we have an understanding that we've got people operating at all sorts of different levels within this team right now. We have a large group of people that are sitting in that victim mode I guess you call it around stuff's coming at me and I just I just it's overwhelmed I have to respond to it. I have to just react to it and then we have another group of people who are operating at this place of I have the presence of mind to see what's going on and to know that actually I can surrender into that because continuing to push the train uphill is not going to work so that presence of mind, I would I would term around um, knowing when pushing in a linear fashion is not going to get you the result that you're after, and actually surrendering to what's the perspective shift that I need to move this exponentially. And then we have a group of people in the middle who have kind of got everybody at arm's length saying, I have to be this bridge between a couple of people that are operating at these new ways of working and, and ready to, to let it go, and to run with it and to recognize that surrender is not the same as give up, but but to, to work at this elevated state. And also I've got this group of people over here, which Lordy, somehow we need them to come on the journey because without them, it's not going to happen. And how do I balance between the two and how I manage between the two and how do I keep chugging along and keep pushing stuff along and keep manifesting those things um, to happen when I've got one team that are, um, one team that are not wanting to take action because it's all just coming at me and it's overwhelm. And I've got another team that are surrendering and letting off the pressure valve. And as a result, all of the urgencies disappeared and I'm caught in the middle going, but we need to make it happen. It's a really interesting dynamic, right? So that's, as I said, that's kind of part one of, of the story was like, this is the problem space that this team is working in. And again, not uncommon in change programs, right? So 
what we decided to do last week was actually implement a new model, which I've worked with many times before around uh, what we would call decentralized decision making. So this is a tool that we start to put in place where we are moving into an environment where we recognize that those hierarchical structures are not necessarily serving us in terms of the decision making, the pace of change, the pace of decision making that's required, uh, and the the ways of working that we want to move to. And so the this model is about putting in enough structure in place that people can feel that sense of security that there is A is some structure. Um, but B, it's it's not so much a it a model around uh, gatekeeping and decision making as it is a model around visibility and enhancing visibility in organizations and the decision making methods that happen as a result, right? So the model says if we have a decision that has a long-term impact, uh, you know, three, five, multi-year impact. If we have a decision that has a wide-reaching impact, maybe it touches multiple technologies, maybe it touches multiple parts of the organization. If we have a decision that we make very infrequently, it's the type of thing we make maybe once a year or once every three to five years, then those decisions we want to make centrally. We make those decisions centrally usually at a um, with with quite a lot of senior people in the room in terms of being able to have that visibility and that transparency across the organization um, and also really bring that rich experience to the decision making process so those decisions long term wide reaching uh, and uh, infrequent we will make centrally but everything else we're going to set it up so that those decisions can be made by the people who are closest to the work they're closest to the opportunity or the risk, and they have the most information about what's going on, and we'll allow them to make those decisions at the coalface. And what this is going to do is ensure that we have visibility for those things that are going to have a big impact. We have a level of comfort over the structure that means that those big decisions get fed back centrally so that everybody can be involved. But equally, it gives us the responsiveness to be able to react without everything having to go up six layers of management before we implement a decision. And so those decisions where uh, we have a localized impact, where we have uh, short-term uh, impacts, where we have, uh, with the, these are the types of decisions that we make very frequently, we make them every day. Let the teams on the front line who are doing the work, who are working with customers, um, the delivery teams, let those teams make those decisions themselves. And so we've, we've pulled together this model. We've decided that we're going to implement it. And last week, we had a total fail. So the team had set up a forum whereby anyone from the organization could uh, turn up and be a part of seeing where the progress of this particular initiative was at. It's a forum for making those decisions, for showing work, for demonstrating working software and saying, cool, this is where we're going next. So it's about collaborative visual, like visibility of what's going on uh, and active decision-making to move things forward and create momentum. Great in theory. What happened in practice? No one turned up. Because we have a massive group of people in the organization who are still operating at that place of I just do what comes at me and if it's important my uh, my manager will be invited into the decision or if I'm that leader I will be invited to a specific decision making forum where we have a meeting about it and we make a decision on behalf of our staff and <laughs> not you know the a, a, a systemic issue around things like funding and finances well actually nothing is going to happen if it's money related because you have to go back to head office for that decision anyway so all of these pressures in the current way of operating meant that in deciding to implement this this new decision making framework and in setting up a, a ritual and a forum around regular openings for decision making and, and movement nobody turned up there was no incentive there's no sense of urgency because we know that that we don't have that date anymore collectively we know that nothing's going to change for me in the next six months so I don't have to worry about it uh, collectively we are so busy dealing with what's thrown at us that we're not in that space of either strategically trying to move things forward or 
um, allowing that flow to carry us in the direction and, and, and guide that gen general direction and have people come towards the um, that that outcome that we're looking for and generate that flow. We have a whole bunch of people that are just operating with, hey, what's being thrown at me, and I'll just do that. And we can barely see two inches in front of our face, right? So my question to you today is, what would you do? You know that you need to create this sense of urgency because otherwise it's going to be put off and we're in the same spot all over again. It's Groundhog Day in six months' time when we have a panic and we go, oh, too hard, let's not do it. So how do we create that sense of urgency? How do we meet people where they're at? So that rather than offering a team who are in total reactivity mode a method and a model that says, hey, we're all going to work in flow together, how do we meet people where they're at rather than provide them with something that looks completely outside of their reality? It doesn't make sense. What would you do? How do you unblock this situation? How do you move forward? Do you go and get the most senior person in the room that you can to tell everybody to do it? Do you pull the coercion lever? How much coercion do you use to implement a collaborative system? Do you try and open for and bring everyone together, have a conversation about it and say, hey, what's holding us up and try and garner consensus in your decision making process that this is actually important and, and we do want to move forward with it. Do you go and implement another date and just tell people that we'll come back to it in six months time? Like, where do we go with this, right? Because the, the crux of it is that with this particular client, he knows that when he gets the tool right, it won't take the pressing and the pushing and the hard work. It won't take that linear train of thought. When he gets the tool right, there's going to be a perspective shift. There's going to be that mindset shift. And the team's going to leap and bound 10, 100, 5,000 steps ahead on an exponential track. And so... My question to you is, what would you do? Where do, where do you take this from here? What, what is the thought process around which tool do I use? How do I generate that motivation? Where do we go from here? How do we, how do we get this thing moving? How do we keep that momentum so that we don't find ourselves in the same position in six months' time? How do we, how do we shortcut that waiting game? How do we allow this to happen in a congruent way, and yet at the same time, grab people by the hand and move them through. Like, what does that decision process look like? What do those tools look like that you're using? And uh, and my promise to you is that I'm going to come back next week and we're going to do part two of this conversation. And I'm going to talk to you about um, what how this plays out. Uh, and if it doesn't happen next week, then maybe it'll be two weeks from now. But I, I commit to you that I will come back with uh, a bit of a case study about how this played out and how this team gets moving again because they're in a really sticky spot right now. You have a, a small group of people who are super passionate who know that what their vision is going to do is change the entire world for this company. They know that it's what they need to do to, um, to, to keep moving and to stay ahead and yet they know that they can't keep pushing because that's not working either. So my commitment to you is that I will come back with part two of this story, but I'm going to leave an open loop and I'm going to ask you, what would you do in this situation? How do you start to shift and move and create that engagement and create that momentum again when it's all fizzled? So that's it from me today. I hope wherever you are in the world, you're having an awesome, awesome day. And uh, yeah, I will see you again very soon with part two um, and we'll work out where it all lands.